Today's meditation is led by Brenda Carroll. I'd like you all to come very present in your body. Just notice where you're touching the seat, how you're feeling. <coughs> Deep in the breath, bringing it down below the navel, above the pubic bone, filling the body with oxygen, allowing the muscles to begin to relax and become soft and strong. Close the eyes, open the mouth, and let the jaw joint be very loose, spacious. Each breath deeper and fuller, welcoming into your body the life force that's around you at all times, waiting for you to receive it, to enjoy it, and to allow the body to come into a place of receptivity for your natural healing, for a quiet and focused mind, so that your, your spirit may rejuvenate. Allow this process to be something that you welcome into your life each day, taking a few moments and focusing on your breath, quieting your mind, and just allowing. You don't have to do anything. Just receive and allow. And feel yourself begin to become stronger, focus, and more vital in life. Each time that we choose to take in contraction, fear, and anxiety, it affects ourselves, not in a positive way. But each time we choose to breathe deeply and quiet the mind, it affects ourselves in a very positive way. So this is something you can do whenever you choose, easily, no cost, just stop and breathe and relax and receive, allowing your natural healing to come forth without obstruction. And when you feel that there are toxicities and different types of resistances within your mind, body, spirit system, just stop and breathe and allow yourself to feel the magic that's there for you. Just quieting the mind and breathing, receiving and releasing. Take this memory with you. Allow that to permeate through every cell of your being, giving yourself the gift of each day being more healthy, more centered, and life is more joyful. So now, taking another deep breath, come again fully in your body, feeling the seat beneath you. And whenever you're ready, slowly opening your eyes and enjoying the rest of the morning. <laughs> This week's presentation is by Barbara Harwood Aitken, better known to all of us here as Pia. She will teach us, in a world filled with chemicals, the top 10 ways to keep from poisoning ourselves and our houses. It's a humorous take on her lectures on indoor air quality at the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture, from which she from which she is recently retired. That won't happen to you. Good morning, all of you. Although I did ask David Letterman for his help with this top 10, he forgot to loan me his signs that say laugh and boo, so you'll just have to do that on your own. Um, it's a rather serious subject, 
all these nasty chemicals in the environment. All of us read articles now and then about how bad things are, but let's just try to add a little humor to it and still get the message. So the first one is, number 10, do not park your car inside your house. <laughs> you may recall from history that as our ancient ancestors moved northward into colder climates, they moved their animals into the downstairs and they lived upstairs. This had the benefit of the heat from the animals rising upstairs, but the indoor air quality wasn't great because of all that methane production downstairs. So Mama eventually said, uh, we're not doing this anymore. They're going out, Dad. Get them out of here. So they moved the horses into the carriage house, and they moved the cattle into a pen, and left the house with just people in it, and maybe dogs that also don't smell great, but not quite as bad as cattle and horses. So um, this worked well for a while, carriages in carriage houses. And one day in New Hampshire, a man bought a Model A. He was a Frenchman. His name was Gerard Dubonnet. And Gerard loved his new Model A, as only men can feel about cars. He would rub it and caress it and polish it. And he was quite an insomniac. So in the night, when he couldn't sleep, he would go out and do that, rub his car and caress it and polish it so it's beautiful in the morning. And this was great in New Hampshire in the summer. He bought it in the spring. All went well till about November. And then he started walking outside to caress his car in his pajamas and slippers and snow, and that didn't get it. So one day in December, he just broke a hole in the side of his house and drove his car in. As his wife looked at him with horror, he said, he got in his car and drove up and said, don't worry, honey, I'm going down to the carriage shop to buy a door. So he went down to the carriage shop, and he got the only thing there was, which was a barn door, which was very leaky, and that was very lucky, because it helped him preserve the indoor air quality in his house, even though he had a machine in his house now. Um, and he named this thing Gerard's for his name, and just gradually it became Garage which we know today as a garage, and that whole thing's made up, so don't vote. <laughs> um, the problem is, although we got used to having strange creatures in our house from our history, those strange creatures may not smell wonderful, but they're not toxic. The stuff in a gas tank of a car is toxic. It's benzene, and it's so volatile that they have those little rubber cocktail umbrellas on the nozzles that you see most places now in the world to prevent us from breathing just the little bit that comes out when we're pumping gas. So we put our car in our garage, and we have faith that this benzene will waft its way up, upward into our building, but it does. And if we don't seal our garage completely from our house, we breathe that benzene. We may not smell it, but we breathe it. We breathe those chemicals. They stay in our bodies. Um, the, the indoor air quality of a garage into a house is a little different than in, in Mexico than it is in New Hampshire or Minnesota or Calgary because in Calgary and Minnesota, most buildings are made of wood and they usually have fiberglass insulation around the garage and in the roof above it for the room upstairs. That does nothing to stop the flow of poisonous chemicals upward and into the house. Here we have masonry walls and masonry ceilings in general. That is pretty protective of a car being inside the house. The only entrance then for that bad air quality is from the door of the garage into your house. So I recommend that you do great weather stripping on the door that goes into your house from your garage. And that you never turn on your car until the garage door is open. Because in the, in the north, these people who warm their cars in their garage are putting out not only benzene, but all of the hydrocarbons that come out of the tailpipe. They're putting those into their house under pressure. So not a good thing. Open your garage door before you warm your car and seal your, your uh, house completely. In the houses I built in the north where we did use, uh, I used mostly SIP panels for the houses I designed and built. That was my background. We didn't do a lot of talk about my background, but I owned two companies in Dallas for 30 years, BBH Enterprises and Enviro Custom Homes. We built 
low-income housing that was energy efficient, and we built custom homes, mostly for people with allergies and chemical sensitivities. We became known for that. Um, to protect the garages in those houses, I would completely isonine the exterior of the garage, the, the, anything that touched the house, the ceiling uh, above the garage, if there was a room above, and the walls contiguous to the house. And then on some houses, uh, our owners even put in refrigerator doors on the, uh, to seal the house from the garage, with the refrigerator seal on the, on the door. So just seal your garage from your house. Here, don't worry about it too much, especially if you just have the tile roof on your garage. It's so leaky that the heat from the garage rises straight out into the air and you're pretty safe. But in the north, don't park your car in your house unless you protect it. Number nine, if you can't pronounce it, you shouldn't be breathing it or eating it or introducing it into the pores of your skin. So in the spirit of Ahmadinejad, the premier of Iran being I'm a dinner jacket, we're going to name some of these chemicals something else. And especially since I can barely pronounce them to teach you. The first one is hexobromocyclododecane. We're going to call it hexbro, there's a cyclone in the cave. <laughs> this toxic chemical is a variety of bromine, and it's used in most polystyrene foam insulation, almost all upholstery fabric backing, and it's been, been found widely in household dust and is shown to bioaccumulate. Bio is you. It accumulates in your body. Brominated fire retardants are what these chemicals are. That's one of them. Another one is called DECA BDE, and it's used to make hard plastics and fabric backing. The same goal originally came with bromine, and that was to stop fire, to retard fire, keep things from burning. But it's a very toxic chemical, and it's known to affect behavior, learning, and memory, and maybe cause liver cancer. And it's being found widely in dust everywhere, and how many of us have friends who are all of a sudden dying of liver cancer? chemicals in the environment. Second, polybrominated. Again, hear that word bromine. Polybrominated. Uh, diphenyl ethers. So we're going to call those polybrominated diaper ether. <laughs> this is another fire retardant. We'll just shorten it and call it diaper ether. Uh, this is another fire retardant, and it's now ubiquitous in coastal waters. Originally, they had found it in a few streams. The NOAA did a study in 2009, and it was found in streams in remote villages in Arkansas, and it was in the fish. We eat that fish, we're getting minted diaper ether in our bodies from eating that fish, and it seems to be everywhere in water now. Kind of a, a downer of a, of a piece of information. Um, exactly what is the problem with bromine? Well, it's one of these words that ends in een, ein, ein, all of those are what are known as endocrine disruptors. They get into our bodies, and our bodies think they are hormones and act accordingly. So if we have a cell of, of a breast cancer cell or a prostate cancer cell, the hormone-related cancers, these chemicals get in our body and shoot the production of those cells upward. So they're very harmful inside our bodies. We want to keep those out. They weren't really identified as endocrine disruptors until the early 90s, but now we're beginning to realize, and the uh, Susan G. Komen Foundation is on to pesticides being part of these chemicals. We'll get to those next, but for the moment, um, some of these chemicals are phthalates, and we, those are P-H-T-H-A-L-A-T-E-S. You've probably mostly heard of these. Um, I call them too late. <laughs> they're in vinyl flooring, they're plasticizers. They soften plastics. Upholstery, wall fabrics, shower curtains, wire jacketing, and other materials with flexible PVC. Am I still on? Yes. Okay. And in some elastomers. Another one is BPA. You'll see signs in drugstores in the US now that say BPA free on baby bottles. They're finally getting the message that that, that fluid, when you put warm fluid into plastic bottles, it releases the chemicals of plastic into the fluid. Even when it's not warm, it still releases it if you leave it in long enough. If you leave the, the liquid in the plastic long enough, like the Garifons here, don't buy those and leave them in your garage for three months and then drink the water. Drink that water in a week and change those bottles and change that water every week so you don't get those chemicals in your body. Um, 
Bisphenols, used to make optical fibers, epoxy products, coating <coughs> adhesives, hard surface substrates, and polycarbonate plastics. These are found in high impact glazings and coatings, as well as the thermal paper we get for receipts. When we touch these, the molecules of those plasticizers go into our fingers, and our skin is extremely permeable. Any of you who've used medicine on your skin know that your skin absorbs just as uh, it absorbs medicine, it also absorbs poisons. And thermoplastic paper, when you get a receipt from the bank, Banamex, just hold on to the corner and barely touch the thing. And any of the other plasticizer uh, thermal paper receipts that you get, touch them as little as possible before you put them somewhere else and dispose of them or put them in a folder and don't touch them again. Um, These, all these ene chemicals are, are chlorine, benzene, toluene, xylene. Anything with ene on the end is generally really dangerous. Um, people said to me, well, what can I do? I use chlorine to clean my house. What you should do is use as little as possible. I took the chlorine away from our maid, and the only time we use it is if somebody in the house is sick, we use it to clean the bathroom a little. Other than that, we use vinegar and water as a mixture for cleaning the ceramic floors around here. It works fine. I've never had a problem. We, they, the bugs don't bother us because we clean it with vinegar. In fact, I find dead bugs around, so I think the bugs are affected by the vinegar the same as they are with the chlorine. So just eliminate these chemicals with enes and enes and ions um, from, your, from your life as much as you can, which leads us directly to number eight, which is do not spray poisons into the air you breathe. Those poisons would be pesticides. And they are in a class of chemicals, mostly. They're, some of them are, are endocrine disruptors, but a lot, of, a lot of them are chlorinated hydrocarbons, which have even more nasty effects on the body, in addition to the endocrine disruptors. So keep away from chlorinated hydrocarbons. That means ray cans. No more ray cans. I, when I was, my kids were little, and I was in my 20s, and one day a wasp was flying around my young child, who was about three, and I ran inside got the red can, and I sprayed the wasp. And he curled up in the air in front of me and dropped to the ground dead. And then I realized my finger was wet from spraying. And I kind of said, it was kind of that oh my god moment. When you go, that stuff is so toxic, it killed him in the air instantly. And I've got it going in my body through my finger. And I washed my hand quickly with soap and water. And then I threw that red can in the trash. And I've never used a pesticide since in my life. And I'm here to tell you, I don't miss it. It's OK. Wasps turned out to be the good guys in my life. And I can go into that in my garden talk more. But they eat the, the gusanos. Wasps eat those little gusanos that get on your, on your lettuce leaves and broccoli leaves. And, and they, they fly their little 747 bodies over. And they dive down. They pick up the gusano. And they walk, fly away with it like flying lunch. So they're very good creatures. Spiders are excellent. They kill all the other bugs. Don't kill spiders. Unless they are, uh, yeah, well, scorpions, yes, we step on those. Um, I don't spray them, though. We just don't have that many scorpions around. If you disturb the ground in this area by building things, then you get some scorpions. But normally, if you live your life normally, you don't have scorpions around. Um, other books. Uh, cockroaches are dispatched by boric acid. Powdered boric acid that you can buy at... Um, uh, pharmacy of Guadalajara, Pharmacy of Christina, any pharmacy, they have the little bottles of white powdered boric acid. Or any hardware store. Or any hardware store, thank you. Um, you can also, in the States, you can buy and bring down here a, a paste. It's a green paste made of boric acid that you can put underneath the counters if, if you have a real problem. I use those in low-income housing mostly because that was a place where low-income apartments were the place where we had the most trouble with, with cockroaches. Um, other than that, I think, I think, uh, I can't think of any other things that I use. Oh, cinnamon for ants. Cinnamon keeps the ants from coming into your house. Powdered cinnamon. Yeah, they won't cross it. So the little ants, the leaf cutter ants are a different matter. Leaf cutter ants can be dispatched. I learned from Jaime Navarro last week. And I tried it twice. It works fabulously. It also works on those little poisonous red ants. Take a, a banana that's soft, roll it in a mixture of yeast and cornmeal and put it where the ants are. They will eat it. They take it back to the queen. It blows her body up and destroys the ant colony. So end of leaf cutters in our garden. 
and of red X in our cars. They moved to our neighbors and read it. <laughs> so now he has to do it. I don't know where they go next, but. Um, so let me give you a couple facts on pesticides just to really discourage you from using pesticides ever. Pesticides have been also been linked to androgen cancers, the ones I talked about, the breast, prostate, and testicular cancers. Um, the, the likelihood of a child getting leukemia is six times greater when chemicals are used on the lawn or nearby agricultural areas and they've leached into the drinking water. More children with cancers, especially brain tumors, had exposure to pesticides than children without cancer. And those tests have actually been done by medical schools. Pesticides are linked to infertility, birth defects, learning and neurological disorders, allergies, and multiple, multiple chemical sensitivities. So my last thing to say about pesticides is, when I was in Dallas and I was buying low-income apartment buildings to retrofit them, make them energy efficient and healthy, and then rent them out, I went into a building one day and I saw a guy walking around with a can, a Mexican guy, walking around with a can on his back, a big can, and a sprayer. And he was going nuts with that sprayer. He's walking through those rooms, he was spraying everywhere, the ceilings, the bottom, and all the rugs. There was a baby, there were baby toys on that rug. He just sprayed that whole apartment. I just watched him do this. And watched him with horror. And I didn't own the place. I couldn't do a thing. The realtor was showing me the building. We, we went into the office. We looked at some of the numbers on the papers on the uh, performance, performance sheets for the building. And I, I said, you know, I want to see one thing. I want to go back in that apartment we were in. So we went back and looked in that apartment. There was a lady and her two children. The little kids were crawling around the carpet playing with those toys. Now, that's a crime. I mean, that's really a crime. I don't know what happened to that kid, but I'm willing to bet that kid's not going to be healthy. So I would say, let's just eliminate pesticides from our bodies and our world as much as we can and use alternative methods. Um, one last word on that, actually. Uh, termiticides. Are, they're sort of a class of their own. They're chlorinated hydrocarbons, uh, so they're not really considered pesticides. But if you're tempted to get termiticides and use them in a house, think how this works. What they do in the north is they completely cover your house with plastic. And then they pressurize it, and they fill it with termite spray. And they, and they leave it in there for several hours, which you can't be there. And then they let, then they let you come back, like, what, 24 or 48 hours later. They let you come back. Well, guess what is on every surface that you touch? Molecules of chlordane, of termiticide. Everything you touch, everything you breathe in that house is still full of that, whether they say it's safe to go back in or not. So don't use those things. Build your houses in the first place so you don't need those. You can put termite traps outside, triangles of diatomaceous earth, or uh, double lot sand around the whole perimeter. Termites cannot go through that. They can't get to your foundation. So do the sensible thing first. Don't use termiticides. Now, now that we're on that, off that cheerful topic, let's go to another one. Number seven, do not cover your floors with a dust magnet that has 53 toxic chemicals in it. That would be called wall-to-wall -wall carpet. <laughs> Styrene butadiene latex that attaches the fiber to the back is a known carcinogen. 120 chemicals are used in its manufacture, many of which are neurotoxins. That means they affect your nervous system. They're in the dyes, the vacuum glues, the fire retardants, the latex binders, the fungicides, <coughs> the anti-static and stain-resistant treatments. So think about it. Would you take a pile of old fabric and throw it on the floor, walk on it for about five years, and leave it there? Well, unless you're a teenage boy. But. <laughs> No, of course you wouldn't. That's what carpeting is. It's fabric on the floor with fibers coming up that catch the things on the bottom of your shoes. That falls down into the fibers, and the mold goes down, the dust goes down in there and gets moldy because old dust gets moldy. Then you step on it, and it comes up in your face, and you're breathing all that in addition to the chemicals that were in the carpet in the first place. So, like, don't use carpet if you want to be healthy. The rugs in Mexico, we use ceramic floors. Fantastic. And, and we use throw rugs that our maids can go out and shake and get rid of the dust in. So, and they're flat and smooth usually. They don't have the, the uh, fibers that, that stick up and try to catch things. The other option in the north, if you have these, 
you can get them thoroughly cleaned and then stop wearing shoes inside your house. And a lot of young people are now doing that. We go to visit friends in California, and anybody under 40 makes you take your shoes off. So it's a whole new thing, and it's wonderful. So number six, do not use products with one real name and one fake name that actually means chemical. So real names, wood, board, lumber, bamboo, cork. Real names of real stuff. Bad names. Particle board, which is just wood chips stuck together with nasty chemical glues that are VOCs, volatile organic compounds. VOCs outgas from those glues. Um, particle board, medium density fiber board. So try this. Go home, stick your head in your cabinets in your kitchen. I can see from the look on some of the guys' faces, their wives have told them to do that before. <laughs> but the reason this time is that you want to smell what's in there. Open your, especially if it's new, open your cabinet and smell. It burns your nose just a little bit. Like going into a fabric store, burns your nose a little bit. You feel that in your nose and you think, hmm, that isn't very good. And it smells just a little. Like t-shirts from the Orient, right? That smell. If you really want to get a nose full of it, go to Ikea. <laughs> Ikea is the world capital of medium density fiber board. My friend calls it Al-Qaeda. She says it'll conquer the world before the terrorists will. It'll destroy us before the terrorists will. Particle board made in China is the very worst of all, sorry. And shi shi for coming. Um, but, but the particle boards made in China have more formaldehyde. They have so much in them that Europe forbids their import. So guess where they take them all? Mexico and US. So um, anyway. When you go into Ikea and smell almost any piece of furniture, you're in the world capital of medium density fiber board. They love it so much they even gave it a human name, Billy. People go into Ikea and eat Swedish meatballs and worship Billy. Billy bookcases, Billy cupboards, Billy boards, Billy headboards, Billy everything. And Billy is actually medium density fiber board. And if you, it's finished on the front, but if you look at the ends, you can see that fiber board is open. So I made the big mistake when Ikea first opened in Berkeley. I went there and bought a bookshelf. I needed someplace to put our music. So I bought a bookshelf that was about this high. We got it in the house and we, we went, oh my God, this thing smells horrible. And I realized right away it was formaldehyde. We took it outside and said, well, let's air it out a few days and it'll be good. We kept checking. It took us six weeks to get the smell, the really bad smell out. And we left out another six weeks because I was afraid that it, it, even though I didn't smell outside, it might inside. So it took us three months to bring in our Billy bookcase. So we never bought anything else from Ikea. Um, a nas another nasty set of formaldehyde soap products are Pergo and Wilson Art floors. Those are made from medium density fiberboard. In the case of Pergo, it has a 1 8 inch piece of wood on top of medium density fiberboard. In the case of Wilson Art, it has a photograph of wood, a picture, laminated to the top of medium density fiber board and then sealed with acrylic. So neither one are good. When you spill something on them, water falls through the cracks and they expand and it warps your floor. But the most important thing is they outgas into the room. So they're not good. Uh, if you want to use wood floors, and here they're not very common, but I have seen people who said, yes, I want a wood floor, our neighbor's one. And uh, I say just use three-quarter or one-inch real, real, real wood with a pre-finished acrylic surface. So it comes to you totally finished, and it's real wood. You can sand that, and you can re-acrylic it if you need to. So it's very healthy. But even healthier, of course, is the ceramic floor we have here everywhere. They can be washed every week and cleaned. And people with allergies do very well in, those, in, the climate with the, in this climate with those kind of floors. And especially when we have the metal uh, curtains that close the, the metal Venetian blinds, either vertical or horizontal, that you could clean. And if you have real bad allergies, you just take all the rugs out of the room. And you have a pretty good room for keeping yourself clear at night with allergies. Um, number five, do not reject the healthiest flooring of all just because, just because it sounds like the floor at junior high summer camp. Yep, concrete. Still concrete but it's concrete with class. Pattern stained concrete floors are wonderful. All of my, I think without exception, every single customer I show these to in Dallas, hundreds of houses wanted pattern stained concrete floors. 
because you can make them into whatever you want. I had a woman who wanted a French chateau. She wanted granite block concrete floor, so we made her made the pattern like granite blocks, and then we painted it white, and then we sealed it, and it looked like she had French granite concrete, I mean French granite blocks for floor. We had a guy who wanted a, a, a gay couple that were love New Orleans, and they wanted to be in New Orleans, so they wanted a house designed like New Orleans, and they wanted their floor to look like an old New Orleans oyster bar. <laughs> so we painted it gray, we put on a coat of blue, and then we sanded it to make it rough here and there. And then we sealed, chipped it. Oh, he wanted to chip too. So we chipped it and then we put a sealer over it. It looked just like a New Orleans oyster bar floor. Uh, we had a client that wanted a red leather floor, but no leather. So we just made it look like red leather. So pattern stained concrete is great. It's very healthy. You clean it just like you clean um, uh, ceramic tile with vinegar and water. Wonderful, healthy surface if you can't do uh, ceramic tile, which you can do here pretty easily. People say, well, what about the concrete? Concrete's not wonderful. It contributes hugely to uh, climate change, global warming, because of the gases that come out of uh, production of concrete. I think it's 7% of the global warming gases come from concrete production. In Italy, there's something called pozzolano that you can use. And you can also use adobe clay uh, materials and make adobe clay floors. But here, I would say, simply use ceramic tile when you can. Okay, number four, easy one, short one, never use vinyl. How many of you saw the movie Blue Vinyl? Yeah, it's a while ago, but it, it showed how horrible the production process is and the chemicals that go into vinyl, first in the production of it. But secondly, vinyl is really bad because after it ages a bit, it starts peeling up on the corners and getting moldy underneath. And I know all of you, at some time in your life, you've gone into either an old farmhouse or an old apartment, and you've seen vinyl flooring in the kitchen or bathrooms peeling up in the corners and turning black. That's mold. That's not good. Um, the worst horror story about vinyl, though, um, in Dallas, I became known as sort of the lady house doctor. And eventually, doctors would call me and say, I have a client who's really sick. We can't figure it out. Can you talk to her about her housing? Or somebody would call me and say, we have a serious problem in our house, and we don't know what's wrong with it. Can you come look at it? So I got this phone call from a little town called Forney outside Dallas. And um, people said they had, the, the family had been in and out of the hospital, including the children, for like 18 months. And they couldn't figure out what was going on. The doctor finally gave up and said, you have to solve this. And they heard about me. And they said, we have this funny blue dust in our house. And I thought, blue dust, maybe I'm over my head here. <laughs> I couldn't figure out on the phone, so I said, okay, I'll be there. And in the first five minutes, I have to find the smell. I have to figure out what the problem is in the first five minutes, because I don't know if all of you know, but when you're in a toxic environment, your body, after five minutes, will mask the smell. You will no longer know that you're in danger. So if you smell something toxic, don't stick around. Get out of there and get somebody to figure out what it is. Anyway, I said, I've got to go in and find out what this is right away. Well, the first thing she said when I hit the door was, here's the blue dust. And she took me to this, I mean, there was blue dust everywhere. And I did this with my finger. I felt it. And I said, do you guys wear a lot of blue jeans around here? She said, that's all we wear. I said, uh, where's your dryer vent? So we went outside. The dryer vent was just above the furnace intake about this far. So that was the blue dust. Harmless, but annoying. So I said, you just... Just tell your builder to move that dryer vent. Get it out of there. So then I said, now the smell. We went back in to the house. And I, I started following my nose. I got to the kitchen. At the end of the counter, I said, what's that purple stain under the vinyl? She said, well, I don't know. It's been there ever since we moved in. I said, well, there shouldn't be purple stain underneath white vinyl. And then I asked her permission to cut it. I had my superintendent who I brought with me to cut a piece out of it, all oh, the smell. Just take the top off. Immediately we figured out somebody had spilled. You, you put down, and when you lay tile, you put the glue down on the floor, and you know, they make a pattern. It's, a, it's got a pattern on it, and then you put the vinyl on top of that. So here's the glue underneath. Somebody had spilled the purple cleaner that you use to clean HVAC equipment. Heating and air conditioning equipment is cleaned off with this purple stuff before you install it to get the grease off. 
So there's the purple stuff. Somebody had spilled it on the floor. And instead of, they didn't want to go back, because everything in Dallas was hurry, hurry, build, 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 make a profit, right? So they, the builder didn't want to go back and clean off the, the glue and have to start over and glue again. So he just said, just cover it up with vinyl. Nobody will ever know. Well, the, the chemical reacted with the glue and the vinyl. And it was outgassing into their environment. It had poisoned everyone in that family. So badly they all had lung issues, headache. The worst of it was the headaches. They all had migraines. Four people in a family with serious headaches all the time. Kids that couldn't function. A woman with terrible chest problems now. She was in the hospital, in and out of the hospital with terrible lung issues. Because somebody was too lazy to clean up a mess after themselves. Kindergarten stuff, clean up your own mess. Anyway, vinyl reacts with a lot of things. It also creates mold. Just don't use vinyl. It's not a good thing. And if you see it in somebody's house, just if you see the black stuff around the mold in the corners, warn them. They're breathing things that are toxic. Get it out of there. So, number three. Don't use inside your house anything that takes a toxic solvent to get rid of, unless you love the smell of lacquer thinner or benzene. So all together now, think about all the guys you know who clean their tools in the garage with gasoline. Don't do that. Don't breathe that stuff. Don't clean your tools with anything toxic. Don't clean anything in your house with toxic stuff. I, um, in my talks in the north, I talk about finishes for wood floors. There's a cleaning finish for uh, floors called Glitza that's so bad they've banned it in Europe. And there's a new one uh, made out of acrylic called Traffic that's very good. But you guys aren't so much into wood floor finishes. So let's just go on to oil-based paints. Because they use oil-based paints all the, up here all the time. <clears throat> they use them on the doors of your house, and they use them in your kitchens to make sure that you can wash the surfaces, right? Well, I have the same problem that everybody else does. I wanted that shiny surface in my kitchen. I wanted to be able to wash all those surfaces. The area behind the stove, you have to wash. But I can't use oil-based paints in my environment. I'm desperately allergic to this stuff. So I tried a bunch of stuff myself. And the answer I came up with is very easy and very non-toxic and works just as well as oil-based paints. Two coats of acrylic paint, two coats of an acrylic sealer like McCloskey's acrylic sealer. I can apply those myself, and after I age them two weeks, they're as hard and firm and solid as oil-based paints. I put hot things on them. They weren't disturbed by it. I washed them with every kind of toxic thing. I could, I could do every kind of abrasive thing, didn't touch it, so it's fine. Two coats of acrylic latex and two coats of McCloskey's or some other acrylic sealer instead of oil-based paints. The caveat on that is if you do doors, it doesn't work well on doors. I could never make it work well on doors because it let, left streaks. The paint left streaks and the sealer left streaks. So the solution for doors is take them outside and paint them and dry them and then bring them inside after they're dry, and then you can use oil-based paints. So, um, now number two is mold is not an interior decorating technique. <laughs> I went to uh, a house in Dallas that people had asked me to look at because they were thinking of buying it. We went in and, and every time, I went in two times with them, both times. The first time there was soup on the stove and it smelled delicious and I was hungry and I thought, oh, that smells wonderful. The second time I went in, there were chocolate chip cookies baking in the oven. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, this smells so good. Well, this was before I knew the trick. <laughs> After the people moved out and, the, and we went back to the house, the smell of mildew and mold was overwhelming. <laughs> they had covered up the smell deliberately with, with um, cookie. We peeled up the vinyl flooring. They, they tore the whole one side of the house out. Um, they were going to change the kitchen anyway, luckily, but we started ripping up the vinyl flooring. The entire surface under the vinyl was covered with mold. The undersurface of the wood that held the vinyl up and the decking was covered with mold. I mean covered, solidly. We went under the house and looked. The house was built on a hill, it sloped downward like this, and the house was here. And if this had stayed a smooth slope, that's fine. The water ran from the street down to the creek, fine but it gradually dug out a, a lake underneath the house. Okay. So we now had a lake under there that was feeding moisture up into the wood, which had not been protected, which was wet most of the time. So there was mold underneath, there was mold on the studs, 
There was mold on the joint, every joist, on the decking and on the floor and underneath the tile. Then we got up into the rest of the house. We started peeling off, off uh, sheetrock. And the sprinkler on the back of the house had not been set properly for a long time. And when they sprinkled the backyard, they were sprinkling the wall. It was a brick wall, had leap holes in it. The water was going through the brick wall, leap holes, going onto the back of the sheetrock. We took that off, and it was actually Stachybotrys atra. So let me give you just a little bit of information about molds. The fuzzy black molds, are the fuzzy dark molds or green molds, are not as toxic as the shiny black ones. The shiny black molds are called Stachybotrys. Those are extremely toxic. If you see that, do not even think about touching it. Don't try to do anything with it yourself. It's so toxic that putting it on your finger can poison you. Just don't touch that stuff. And it comes from running water. Stachybotrys must have a running water surface. So in another part of this house, there were Stachybotrys running down. There were stairs going up. And beside the stairs was a, a sheet rock wall. We pulled out of it's covered with Stachybotrys. The bathtub drain had been leaking for years and had been running down that wall and just keeping it wet every time somebody took a shower or a bath. The water ran down that wall and just kept the whole thing wet all the time. So they had Stachybotrys there and on the back wall. They had, um, of course, termites love mold. They love to eat that stuff. So the back wall in another part of the house was moldy just with Aspergillus, which is fuzzy black mold. And the termites had moved in, so we had it, the most amazing artwork. When we opened that, when we opened that wall, there were patterns that were absolutely gorgeous all over the wall from termites, funguses, black molds. It was like I took a picture of it, and people said, "Is that an art piece?" Yeah, right, unintended. But anyway, molds are not a decorating technique. If you see black, if you see black stuff in your house, if you see the fuzzy black molds or green molds. You can clean those with chlorine. Unfortunately, the only thing that kills those is a biocide. I mean, it kills you too, biocide. But chlorine will kill those. Half and half of water painted on those surfaces. If you have sheetrock with mold on it, you can't do anything with that except get rid of it. Get the sheetrock out of there. Clean the wood that's behind it with, with Clorox two times. Dry it and put two coats on there. Let it dry and then spray it with kills before you reinstall sheetrock. Here, what we call uh, a mold in this area is called Solitra, but it's not mold, it's a fungus. And it's not harmful, most, mostly because most everything's outdoors, with certain exceptions. There was one house that I went to in Riviera Alta, and that house had been sitting in, in uh, sort of like squish, you know? The water up there was taken around in uh, channels around the ends, but the natural water, one of my, I teach my students four water rules, and one of them is water will flow downhill, right? That's real tough to think about. And the second one is water flows, follows the pattern of path of least resistance. So it's going to go where it always went. So when some builder covers up a, an arroyo and channels it around, that's good until you get a flood. And when the flood comes down, it's going to go the way it always went. It's going to go right down. And it soaked every one of the lawns all the way down. And at the bottom, when you walk on the lawns, you're, it, you, it's like sponge. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And the house is sort of floating on this water, right? So Salitra is coming up because if the water is the water's wicking up the brick walls in the back. And where it's going to gather mostly is in the back of closets that are closed, where clothes are against the wall and they keep the moisture there. Or if you have curtains behind a bed, you keep the moisture back there. Or if you have, as in this case, we had windowsills that were made exactly 90 degrees instead of having a slope. So the windowsills captured the water, and the water couldn't get away, so it just soaked right in there into the brick and went down into that wall and kept it wet, wet from the back. In addition to moisture coming, waking up, into the brick, it was coming down from the outside into the brick. So we had this very wet house, and we had to just do things to put a fridge drain around it. We had to remove some of the uh, clothes and get that out of there and dry the house, take out the ceramic tile, dry the floors. If you find these kind of conditions, just get it dried out somehow. And I know that's better, easier said than done in a climate where we have a rainy season with a lot of water. But you, it can be done, and there are experts who can help you figure out how to dry it out. 
most places around here aren't that severe. Um, the exception was the, how many of you live in Racquet Club or know where Racquet Club? Not too many people. Well, in the Racquet Club, if you drive up there and you go by the entrance gate, there's a house right on the right. Right now, it's kind of half painted. It's half white. They ran out of paint, I guess. And the back half is still concrete. That house was completely destroyed by the flood that ran down there. Soaked the house. It was halfway up the house. Uh, the arroyo recreated itself. that had always been there. And it, the arroyo, it came down the street, and then it ran down that arroyo and turned into the, to the Amazon River. And it filled that house up halfway, and there sits that house, and now it's going to be sold to some unsuspecting person who's, you know, it's not going to happen again, maybe for a few years. But those kind of places you need to watch out around here. You need to watch and see where the house you buy is in relation to the hill and the water flow. And just keep in mind those two water rules. Water flows downhill, it follows the path of least resistance. Pretty simple. So, so mold is not an interior decorating technique, and water must be watched in terms of your houses. And finally, number one, the number one way to have no poisons in your house and your interior environment is to live in a tent in the healthiest climate in the world. <laughs> well, maybe not a tent. There's a home of a gardener we know named Margarito who lives at the end of La Cristina Road. He has a 99-year lease from the Mexican government on a piece of lakefront property down there. And he lives in the best example of housing made from recycled waste I've ever seen. It's a corrugated roof. It's pallets for floors and pallets for walls. It's blue plastic to keep the rain out. And Margarito's not a dumb guy. His wife, Danielle, is lovely. And they have their grandchildren down there every weekend riding the horses that they keep in the little pen around their house. And so one day I said to Margarito, Margarito, I heard that you have a house in Lake Chapala. Why do you live down here? He, he just smiled. He said, Senora, el aire aquí es muy bueno y muy fresca. <laughs> yes. OK, thank you very much. Great information, but I'm afraid I'm not going to remember half of it. Uh, do you have a book, or is there a book I can get? Well, I wrote a book called The Healing House, okay. and it has a lot of that information in it, not the specific names of chemicals, but if you just avoid classes of chemicals, you're safe. Okay. You know, endocrine disruptors that are enes and anes and ions, okay. and pesticides, and, and the basic information. My, my book, The Healing House, is available on Amazon.com. Okay, second question. I have some friends that have termites uh, that have gotten into the house. What can they do? Here in, uh, in yes. Mexico. And what kind of building is it? Um, brick. Ceramic floor. Termites? Yeah, they got in the wall. The walls have some wood in them. And kitchen cabinets. Some, some timber. Okay. Um, well. You mentioned and, traps? Yes. Uh, termite traps are just, uh, you dig them in the ground and put wood in there. And it notifies you that they're in the neighborhood. Okay. Um, putting the double lot sand around the foundation. But this, this sounds like a different kind of situation. I'm not exactly sure. I know that if you paint that with chlorine, they don't like that either. Okay. If they, you paint that with chlorine and water, um, that specific spot. If they have a whole house full, let, let's talk after. Okay? okay. Can you try to figure out what that is about it and where that is? Yes, sir. Okay. I, uh... Here we go. As long as you have all these uh, good tips, you know, about uh, keeping insects at bay, we, and I, and I think a lot of other people do the same thing, are overrun by these very tiny little ants, the sugar ants. Right, what cinnamon. Are you, what are you going to do about that? Cinnamon. Oh, cinnamon. Dry too. cinnamon. Canela, you can buy it big jars yeah, at Costco, yeah, yeah. and you sprinkle it in the hole where they're coming in. Yeah. Um, the other thing you can do is sort of a, a very simple thing, and that is if they're coming in like behind your kitchen cabinet, sometimes that's where they come in, just silicon caulk there. Yeah, so well, it'd be a silicon. In, in, in our case, they found a way through the electric lines, and so they, they're everywhere. And wow, I'm sorry about this thing. I don't know why it's doing that. I'm uh, pointing at the speaker behind you. Oh, okay. okay um, I, I their electric lines, just put wherever they're coming in, put cin powdered cinnamon, they won't cross it. Oh, okay, I'll try that. Uh, it works really well. I have a remark for this gentleman. Uh, 
we had the same problem with termites. And uh, we were told to replace the wood that the, that the termites were in and replace it with, with perona wood. Yes, perona. They don't, they don't like it, so it's, right. it's an expensive way to go. Jeez. Show us which way to point that thing so it doesn't do that. Okay, when there's a speaker behind you, protect yourself from the speaker so that it can't receive the mic. All right. Okay, Perona wood, let me say a word about that. We have Perona wood in our house. It's our, all of our cabinets. It was there when we moved in. I found out it's an endangered wood. Sad. But it is very resistant to, uh, to termites. So if you can find a source of recycled Perona wood around here, that's a good thing. Okay. Years ago, they sold a product called Soylex. I'm talking about a long time ago, but they used it very frequently in Detroit on the paints that were used in low-income housing. And I've never seen that product again. It was remarkable. You just took a sponge, water, and it washed the paint as if it were brand new, left it that way. Have you ever, uh, do you know what product it is that they may have renamed it with chemicals? They uh, call it Soylex, S-O-I-L-E-X. No, I don't. That's an interesting thing to look up, though. Let's, let's uh, Google that one and see what we see. The other thing, were you responsible for the floating house in Phoenix from Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, grandson? No. Do you have anything to do with that? No, I've never designed anything for Frank Lloyd Wright. I'm not in that category. What I teach there is sustainable architecture, and I think it sounds like a good idea that I have it. Huh? I, I don't know about that, but you know who might know the answer to that is Don. Where, Don, where are you? Right here. Did not do a floating house in Phoenix. He did not do a floating house in Phoenix. No, so. no, he didn't. His, I understand it was his grandson. Eric Lloyd Wright? Did Eric Lloyd Wright do anything there? I don't know. That's an interesting, another interesting question. Okay. Carol. Um, can you tell me what memory foam is all about? Because I smell it in our house. Memory foam? Is that the one where you sleep with the pillows and stuff? That's a, that's a polyurethane foam. And uh, all polyurethanes have some of these chemicals in them. So. You know, if you if you smell it and you don't like it, don't use it. Get some some goose down pillows. But you can't smell it after five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> what about pesky mosquitoes? Uh, what about off? Citronella. 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 Use your, on yourself. They make they make creams and bottles with citronella in them and citronella plants. I just bought a big citronella plant and put it by my dining room table. I mean, by my outdoor where we always eat. But we really don't have too many mosquitoes in our house. Yes? What about bug spray? Not bug spray. Uh, mosquito repellent. You go off. The Amazon off and see. There are, is that there, safe? There are deep free mosquito repellents you can buy. Look at a website called Green America. www.greenamerica.com. You can buy deep free bug sprays. The D isn't great for your body, right? I'd like to ask you about silica. Is there a non-toxic way of removing it, or what is the best way to remove it? Um, you scrape it off in the dry season. You let that area dry. You put chlorine on it, uh, half chlorine and half water, paint it on, let it dry again. And then if you can find kills, K-I-L-Z, you spray it with kills, and then you repaint the area. It should last several years. Unless you have the situation that I described before, which is if your house is sitting on water, uh, nothing's going to solve, solve it until you get the water removed from around your house. So you have to have somebody put in French drains or some way to get rid of the water. But if this is just normal silica that forms sort of like an inch above the ground on most houses in Mexico, I'm going to get over here and see if that stops the feedback. Um, if you get that, it's just a little kind of roll every now and then somewhere, just do that little treatment. Scrape it off, let it dry, put chlorine on it, let that dry, spray it with kills, or just paint it again. I couldn't find kills, so I just painted it again, it works okay. It, it comes back maybe three, four years later, but it's been pretty good. We've had five, four years now without it, so I think we're okay. I think it, yeah, it's inevitable. You know, 
if we left, uh, I, I don't know if you've seen the book by Alan Weinstein called The World Without Us, but if you just leave your house, everything's going to get moldy and silly, and that's how things return to the earth. Mold is a recycler. It's nature's recycler. So it's going to try to eat whatever there is around. It likes cellulose products the most, so it's going to try to eat things that are made of paper or wood first. But eventually it'll get to brick and eat the brick. So that's what Salitra's trying to do. So we'll, we'll take another question. Okay, I think that's Doris? All. We, have, we, have, we have time. We're good. Doris? I have two questions. One's about the, the chlorine or bromine in the swimming pool, and the other's about sunscreen. Yeah, sunscreen, there's a product called Sol, S-O-L. It's a new product, and it costs a bloody fortune. I bought a bunch of bottles of it at uh, Any Mountain in Berkeley when I was there last year, and it's a healthy sunscreen that doesn't have bad chemicals in it, S-O-L. Uh, what was the first part of your question? Yeah, so we've had, in Canada, we had a hot tub, and they used bromine, and we thought that was better than bromine. And now in uh, heat, we have a chlorine one. Yeah. Can you well, you know, truth is, when you drink water in anywhere in the country, in the U.S., it has chlorine in it, a little bit. And that's not good for us, but I don't know any alternative. And I've talked to a lot of people about that in the process of writing the chapter for a book called Gaia and Turmoil, uh, which is out, It's I think, in its third printing already uh, from MIT Press last year. I wrote the water chapter for them uh, upon request. It's a book that has a chapter on the various subjects of what's going on in the world by invitation. I wrote the water one. And I looked at all that chlorine. And the saddest thing I ran into was in my own hometown, Sydney, Nebraska. The water tests perfectly pure coming out of the Ogallala Aquifer. But the citizens in town demand they chlorinate it because they don't feel safe unless they do, which is insane. Let's poison ourselves so that we can make sure we're not poisoning ourselves. <laughs> Something wrong with the logic here. Um, in swimming pools, if you keep the chlorine balance, the, the base and acid balance correct, you have to use less chlorine. So you get one of those tester kits, and you make sure that everything's always in balance, in which case you have to use much less chlorine. Use as little as possible. And when things turn green from algae, algae doesn't hurt you. Chlorine is more dangerous to you than algae. So you know, just keep it chlorine on the light side if you have to use it. The best thing is salt water. Is circulating salt water. And, and swimming pools in really classy, expensive places now use recycled salt water. Okay, other questions? Uh, yeah, I, you mentioned a mixing sort of a squishy, squishy banana with um, oatmeal. Yeast and, and, no, yeast and cornmeal. Yeast and cornmeal. Okay. Right. Yeah, I just mix a little yeast, a little cornmeal, roll a banana in it. I cut the banana in half, actually, so it gets more stuff on it. And then I put it together again and put it out where I saw the ants. And I mean, that's magic. It's amazing. It's just amazing. Yes, ma'am. Is that peeled or unpeeled? Well, I took it, first time I took it out of the peel, and then I rolled it in the stuff, and then I got the stuff all over the peel, and then I put it together and uh, put it back together again like a banana. And when I came back, the whole thing was gone. So, and then the next time, the peel kind of fell apart, and it was too awkward to mess with. So, and the banana was really squishy. So I just did the banana by itself, and it was all gone, and it worked. So, you know, I guess it doesn't matter. Uh, just whatever they like. I think Margaret wants to end this now, and it looks like there aren't any more questions, so. Well, I don't want to end it too soon. <laughs> anyway, we certainly appreciated all, all the things we ought to do. That is kind of bad news to see. It's a difficult assignment to read your life of those things, but better in the end. I wanted to leave time to tell you uh, about our presentation on December 18th. We're doing something very different. We, through some luck, were able to get Manuel Aguilar, who's a professor of world and Latin American art history at California State University, Los Angeles, a native of Guadalajara, to give a two-hour PowerPoint lecture on Mexican muralism. And he is considered a major authority on this, has published widely. We can't have him here because of uh, the projection problems. So we're moving to 
the plaza, the club behind El Hardin, tell me, and I'm supposed to believe it, that they can uh, darken the room and they have the equipment for projecting. So um, don't come here December 18th. We'll start at uh, 10 in the morning and we'll be out at noon and uh, it'll be a fascinating lecture. And then we have so many muralists here who really come from those roots and it's just part of living in Mexico that we should know everything we can about it. Now next week we're going to learn about virgins and there are lots of them, believe it or not. There are lots of them and it's just about the time of the birthday of the Virgin of Guadalupe and who better to tell us than Judy King herself. So we hope to see you next week. You can turn your cell phones back on. And thank you for coming. Pick up your coffee cups and stack your chairs.